We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Welcome. Um, I'm hoping that this round table creates um, uh, alliances and networks and gives us at least some way of coming together to tackle just a very small problem, um, which is about free speech and expression. It is interestingly titled about um, the error which many of us have seen when we try to actually reach a website, a broken link, and then we say it's not found. And uh, unfortunately, that has become the state of affairs in the countries we live in. Right now, we are mostly concentrating on where the majority of the world lives, which is Global South and uh, Southeast Asia. Um, this is not supposed to be a panel, but a roundtable discussion. So um, I urge you all to uh, turn on your videos, join in. Um, uh, I think after two years of the pandemic, everybody is pretty forgiving about wherever your settings are from wherever you are joining in right now. So please don't hesitate. Um, we do have at least um, speakers here in order to initiate us onto discussions. And so what we will do is that I'll introduce a little bit here, then uh, each of the speakers will give us an opening statement for two minutes about what's happening in their regions. And uh, that will set the stage for further discussion. Um, I would, uh, we have a few people joining in, trickling in, and I think we are having some technical difficulties, but um, uh, what will be a tech conference without technical difficulties? So um, we need to check that box, obviously. So um, uh, with not much further ado, um, uh, a very warm welcome we have with us, um, uh, Chris, who's a political scientist and lecturer at University of Amsterdam, amongst other things, we have uh, Oliver Spencer, who's an advisor to Free Expression Myanmar. Um, we do not have Nigat Daad, who is the founder of DRF Pakistan, uh, because of um, a last minute conflict uh, of um, uh, being uh, appearing on too many sessions, I believe. Nigat, uh, like all of you, is uh, a lot in demand. Um, we have Radhika Jalani, who is a council and manages the free speech tracker and internet shutdowns project at the Software Freedom Law Center India. And we have the legal director of uh, the Software Freedom Law Center India, Prashant Sugathan. My name is Mishri Chaudhary. I am a lawyer. Um, and long, long time ago, uh, I was relevant uh, when I started the Software Freedom Law Center India. Um, and now it's run by much more competent people. So um, uh, now uh, what I want to just say is that if, if you, like me, are a fan of The Simpsons, you may have seen that uh, a Simpson episode recently lampooned censorship, and then it vanished in Hong Kong. Um, it was um, about government's effort to suppress our memory. Um, and uh, governments just uh, forget the sense of irony. Uh, they talk about censorship, and then the episode just vanishes. Um, further underscoring the point everyone is making. Human Rights Watch reported that at least 83 governments worldwide use the COVID-19 pandemic to justify violating the exercise of free speech and expression, as well as peaceful assembly. Um, authorities have attacked, detained, prosecuted, and in some cases killed critics also. They have broken up peaceful protests, or in some cases allowed them to continue for a longer than a year and then taken back legislation. And um, they have closed media outlets. They have started the usual harassment through tax as well as enforcement of um, uh, arbitrary cases and enacted vague laws criminalizing speech that they claim threatens public health. The victims have included journalists, activists, healthcare workers, political opposition groups, and anyone who has criticized the government's response to the pandemic or 
this is just a great excuse to, to go further. Um, over 13,000 hours of internet shutdowns in India were reported in 2019 and 2020. Uh, the country of my birth um, is the shutdown capital of the world, um, not a thing which we are very much proud of. And um, thereafter, at least, um, uh, other than that, what we're also watching is that fueled by explosion in the adoption of digital technologies across Southeast Asia, the digital space has become a new battleground for the contestation of um, these norms, which we call um, essential to democracy. Now, these technologies and social media platforms represent not only economic growth as well as democratization of free speech and expression, but also a means through which um, regimes, both democratic as well as authoritarian, can exercise control with an increasingly robust um, uh, tools uh, available at their disposal to impose coercive measures. Um, if, we, if we watch what's happening in India, or we see Vietnam's cybersecurity law, um, or in Thailand, Myanmar, um, any of these, um, many of the governments will be claiming ostensibly to solve the tricky problem of hate speech um, and misinformation, and uh, whether it is health information or other kind of misinformation, and then come down strongly uh, over exercise of democratic rights. So here we are um, trying to just figure it out what's exactly happening in various regions. Um, what are these new battle lines? How can we all come together? And is there at least some scope in um, having an alliance which, is, um, which works across Asia and then exercise our power, not only against governments, but also the companies? Because unless things happen in the US or European Union, um, it seems that the companies will not pay much of attention and not much uh, will happen in our um, part of the world. So um, with that, I'm going to start with Oliver today. Oliver, um, if you could just tell us in two minutes a brief overview about what's happening, what you think is happening in your part of um, where you work and how um, free speech and expression are being impacted. Sure, thanks very much. Um, I hope you can hear me fine. Um, I just want to um, talk for the two minutes about a specific example of how freedom of expression is limited, and that's in regards to internet shutdowns, which is something that we all work on quite a lot. Um, uh, in Myanmar, the, um, the then government on the 21st of June 2019 um, started an internet shutdown, which affected 1.4 million people. Um, a year later, 2G was restored there um, with 3G and 4G still blocked. Um, at that point, it was until the 31st of March, 2021. But then we obviously in Myanmar, we then had the coup on the 1st of February of this year. Um, and over those following weeks, uh, a series of internet shutdowns took place, um, which of course are fairly absolute restrictions on freedom of expression and the reversing uh, access to information. Um, when we got to the 15th of March this year, we had a total mobile shutdown of all data across the country. Uh, so that's, uh, again, a further limitation on freedom of expression and access to information. Um, the military then turned back, turned the internet back on um, at the end of May, but using a whitelisting system. So I just wanted to summarize uh, that, that kind of situation in Myanmar. Um, what does it tell us um, about the uh, situation of freedom of expression? Um, in this case, uh, what we're seeing is um, how digital is used uh, by the authorities to restrict freedom of expression in a very absolute maximum kind of way. Uh, we, um, the, the authorities in these kind of cases uh, may claim that certain restrictions are temporary and issue specific, um, but actually what we found is that these kinds of shutdowns and limitations on freedom of expression and access to information. Um, they may be temporary in nature, but they create the experience, the technical capacity, the political cover, um, public acceptance for the authorities to take these kind of 
uh, attacks on uh, freedom of expression and access to information. Um, until now, we always were saying that um, uh, the Myanmar authorities and the way that they uh, looked at freedom of expression, they very much copied Modi's government in India. Uh, they obviously have similar legal uh, backgrounds, legal frameworks created by the uh, British colonialists. Um, but now, obviously, what we're seeing in Myanmar since the coup is that actually they've sort of surpassed the Indian model and they're now very much looking at sort of Chinese slash North Korean uh, model. Um, and um, what we can see from this is that these kind of temporary actions of internet shutdown um, uh, actually lead to something uh, much worse um, and the established acceptance of uh, limitations on freedom of expression and access to information. Um, and it sort of feeds into the slippery slope doctrine so that governments, uh, sorry, that um, governments that may be protecting you in particular countries around the world right now, um, they're creating the frameworks and the experiences and the capabilities to be able to uh, heavily restrict freedom of expression. Um, and, you know, in 10 years time, we've already seen from sort of Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi, uh, Erdogan, etc. what can happen when you get a change of government and how the uh, systems that they've put in place can seriously restrict freedom of expression going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Oliver. Um, bad ideas have a way of traveling um, and the governments love um, uh, to copy the bad ideas and uh, from a democratic uh, government um, to an authoritarian one. Um, uh, let's uh, move on to now um, Chris and um, uh, Chris, your opening statement, please. Yeah, hello everyone. So my name is Chris Rauchrock. I'm a political scientist from Amsterdam, as Michi told you. Uh, I study how digital technologies shape and are shaped by authoritarian forms of governance. And in 2020, I studied the politics behind India's internet shutdowns. And I will briefly make an opening statement about the shutdowns and how, in my view, they affect freedom of speech, freedom of uh, expression. Uh, so as you know, and as Mishi already told you, uh, India holds the record for issuing the highest number of internet shutdowns worldwide. And for my interviews uh, in my research, I asked uh, a dozen of Indian officials who are responsible for issuing the internet shutdowns on why so many shutdowns in India are issued. So I basically asked the people that literally press the kill switch why they think it's necessary to do that so often. And when asked this question, I received the same answer throughout, namely that the internet shutdowns are unfortunately sometimes necessary because social media is often abused for spreading rumors and hate speech that could foster communal tensions in India and possibly violence. Now, the shutdowns, in my view, are not only a gross violation of Indian citizens' civil rights, including their freedom of expression and their freedom to access information, but I believe that they also aim to solve a problem, namely the social media-fueled communal tensions that the Indian government has by and large created itself. So the Hindu nationalist BJP government of India has, in my view, over the past years, established a highly polarized political climate, wherein Indian Muslims are constantly framed as this internal security threat to India's Hindu majority, as second class citizens whose loyalty to the Indian state can never be trusted, and last but not, not least, as sympathizers of jihadi terrorism. So in the process of doing so, the Indian government has contributed to the perfect environment actually for online hate speech and inciting messages to thrive. So the internet shutdowns are therefore similar to firefighters who first set a building on fire and then start to extinguish the fire with such brute force that the complete building collapses. They are an extremely blunt and very harmful government response to the problem that the government has helped to emerge in the first place. So that's my opening statement. Okay, um, uh, a lot of uh, attention um, on India and internet shutdowns, but Chris also makes the point that with the rise of internet access, um, there are um, online hate and false rumors have become also the drivers of domestic conflict in the region. And uh, sometimes 
um, because of um, no matter who the source of this information is, it just becomes necessary in order to shut the communications, to control things on the ground. Um, uh, ahead of the Biden's Democracy Summit, um, I know those of you who follow online, you're also learning there are different ways democracy can be defined. And words don't mean much. I think we are all now trying to figure it out what's moving here. I'm going to uh, move to Radhika um, and uh, uh, for your opening statement, please. Hi, so my name is Radhika. I uh, work on internet shutdowns and free speech at the Software Freedom Law Center in India. We're based out of Delhi and we've recently started something called a free speech tracker through which we're trying to figure out the free speech violations that are happening across the country. As I mean, we have heard from Mishi, we have heard from Chris, India is leading the world in terms of internet shutdowns. Uh, to give you a number, we have 551 shutdowns that we've recorded till 2021. 44 of those have happened in um, have happened in the year 2021, and most of them are in Kashmir. So, uh, to give you a couple of reasons why they, I mean, the reasons why there have been such curbs on speech. One is, you know, because people think like authorities feel that cheating in exams, uh, cheating in exams causes uh, causes law and order situation. That's why they shut down the internet. Then there are other excuses as, as communal riots, as a number of things. I, I mean, and other things. One of the one of the reasons why you know to talk about why internet shutdowns are so bad is uh, is on women in marginalized communities. So to understand it in that context, uh, women and marginalized communities uh, largely depend on internet to be able to express what little uh, space that they have in a patriarchal community like India. Shutting down internet, imposing restrictions on free speech, uh, online harassment, which is also a form of you know restricting speech on the internet, restricting speech in real life, uh, ends up impacting their rights a lot. Now, the, since the pandemic has happened, uh, education has moved online. As an organization which conducts digital security trainings and trying to train marginalized uh, women and children across, we hear a lot that they fe they face a lot of online harassment in this page, in the space, which restricts them from participating anywhere. And this is also a form of uh, you know restricting speech. Um, and and there, I mean, and there doesn't seem to be any solutions that are coming up from the authorities, uh, from you know, from even even uh, this the topic of understanding how internet shutdowns or any other or online harassment on the internet is impacting women in marginalized communities is largely uh, you know largely ignored by civil societies so that's something that you know that's something that a coalition uh, i believe is going to help uh, and that's my opening statement all right um i i wonder why we think that india there's so much emphasis on india uh, we have a lot of um, uh, attendees here also who are in person. Um, uh, we can see you in a tiny window, all of you jammed together. Thank you for joining us in person as well. Um, I think it's also important to point out that um, it is a very large market and also a democracy, uh, a large uh, democracy um, open to the rest of the world, unlike our neighbors across the Himalayas where they have um, um, their own companies and uh, the large platform companies are not allowed inside. Um, so that does have a bearing about a large market, what decisions will it take? And in a democratic form, what it actually does to regulate that kind of speech uh, is something which is looked upon by several other countries. Um, uh, if good ideas get copied very fast, I am hope, uh, uh, which actually um, we would like to believe, but uh, the, the record states that bad ideas are the ones which are multiplying at that state. Um, let's hope uh, that doesn't happen. So over to um, Prashant. Prashant Sugathan, Legal Director of Software Freedom Law Center India. Thanks, Mishi. And thanks, everyone, for joining this session. Um, Mishi was focusing on the word democracy in her opening statement. And we had a lot of other speakers also talking about democracy. Um, India prides itself in calling it the world's largest democracy. Unfortunately, if you look at 
a series of events in the recent years, we are slowly sliding towards, I would say, the path of uh, more of an autocratic regime. Uh, that definitely is not good news, especially uh, if, I mean, although the government talks a lot about uh, digital India and using, uh, let's say, digital platforms, uh, having various means for the people to reach out to government using digital platforms, but uh, the way the regulations have been applied in India, it definitely is not in the right direction. Those have been in a manner which have affected the rights of people. So we have seen internet shutdowns, like the way Chris and Radhika mentioned. There have been website blocking instances, app bans where um, various applications, web apps, mobile apps were banned. Then we had a lot of instances where social media uh, Twitter handles, uh, Facebook accounts were suspended, surveillance across the board, and also regulations of OTT platforms and even independent publications, uh, digital publications being regulated and in some uh, instances even banned. Uh, let me start with um, an example of website blocking, where there was a draft law which was uh, being discussed uh, relating to the environment impact. And there were a lot of these environment groups who were trying to uh, petition the government, who were trying to raise awareness about these laws, and they had come out with various websites. And suddenly, these websites started disappearing one by one. That is when we found that these were really being blocked by the government. And there are specific rules for blocking of websites. But in this case, definitely these websites were not doing anything which would have affected the security nation, security of the nation, or its friendly relations with other countries, because these are the reasons for which websites can be blocked. But yes, this was only a case of design, something uh, against the policies of the government, and these websites were blocked. And then there were also rules introduced by the government which had affected the farmers, and there were farmer protests across the country. And suddenly you find that Twitter handles which are talking about these, webs um, about these protests, uh, Facebook accounts, these were getting blocked. Yes, there were also internet shutdowns in this regard, which Radhika talked about and Chris talked about. But this, not just uh, internet shutdowns, but we also saw these accounts, social media accounts getting blocked. Then there were also instances where OTT platforms were um, like Netflix and Prime. And there were like shows which were, uh, I mean, if you look at India, Movies, when it comes to movies, we have something called the censor board. That's a board for film certification, which is often called the censor board because their main job is censoring movies. It's not a case of film certification, classifying the movies into various categories. It's mostly they're telling the uh, film makers that you cannot have these in a movie and then censor them. But when it came to OTT platforms, at least the viewers could watch movies the way they wanted. And that was a choice which suddenly the Indian public enjoyed with the OTT platforms like Netflix and Prime. But suddenly, um, there were a lot of forces, a lot of uh, people who were not very happy with this. And then we had an obliging government who also wanted some kind of control over these platforms. So across the board, we have seen controls being exercised over social media, over these platforms like OTT, and even with publications, independent digital publications who were uh, competing with the regular news outlets and who were giving more of independent news uh, not affected by government views to the public. Yeah, so that is what's happening, unfortunately, in India. Um, I'm looking forward to discussing it with all others uh, from the region and from across the world and see if we can form uh, alliances, coalitions uh, to take the discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh... Sorry for that uh, dampener, but uh, uh, for people who work on these issues and activists, I think the work that never stops. So um, unfortunately, this is a, a, another unique way where we love the new um, form of empowerment which uh, digital modes of expression have now given us. Uh, the democratization, the way to speak anything, the way to consume content, uh, from all across the world, um, irrespective of um, what our laws say. 
and also the ability of independent news media outlets to be able to now, uh, at a very minimal cost, be able to speak to the world and talk about these things. But when this meets also the traditional forms where um, uh, the growth of internet use, often through mobile phones in our regions, because we have leapfrogged that, has provided new tools to inspire and coordinate hatred and conflict. Um, what do we do here? I think uh, last fall, um, the French president Emmanuel Macron publicly criticized Muslim extremism and defended the French citizens' right to caricature uh, uh, peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad, on the grounds of free speech and expression. 5,000 miles away in a small Bangladeshi village, um, a local school principal praised the French president's condemnation of religious extremism on Facebook. That screenshot was spread around his village and the false claim that he supported depictions of Prophet Muhammad, which is not what he had said. This resulted in a group vandalizing and burning several homes of a different religion. So now I urge all of you to jump in. Please turn on your videos or give us at least some sign of that you want to speak in or just unmute yourself uh, to at least examine briefly how the issues in the Western world are understood very differently than the issues which are happening in our region. And why it is important is because a lot of times the tendency is to just copy the solutions also. Uh, what may work in a system like the European Union may not work in our parts of the world. So if we can examine the differences a little in this round, that would be very useful. Uh, please feel free to jump in otherwise, um, uh, or we will uh, uh, go to the uh, panelists uh, uh, to examine this further. Okay, um, Chris, uh, perhaps why don't we start uh, with you? And I see one video turned on, Hayhurst's video, and we'll come to you after this. And if I'm butchering the pronunciation of your name, just shout it out. But um, and I'll and I'll correct myself and learn. But uh, let's start with Chris. So, uh, can, can you repeat your question once more, Michi? My question mostly is that, um, as I said, certain things which may work in the Western democracies and other parts of the world, they may not work in the Southeast Asia. And right. so if we can go further and examine the differences between what's happening. Right. Yeah. So I think that governments all around the world, both in like Western democracies, as well as governments in the global South, whether they are democratic or more authoritarian, are trying to kind of find a way to better govern social media platforms and limit their immense powers. Um, I believe that in the latest Freedom House report, they've looked at 70 countries and 48 of those countries are have come up in the previous year with legislation aiming at regulating large tech companies. And the question to me is, what these attempts mean for the freedom of expression and the free flow of information in cyberspace and whether they these these legislation can hold platforms accountable without limiting citizens civil rights okay and i think that the the um the the new laws that have been created and have been adopted uh, in india over the past year are not so much a step in the right direction. For instance, the, the government basically wants to um, become the ultimate arbiter of what is allowed uh, on social media platforms and what is what is perceived as hate speech and, and as uh, content that uh, has no place on large social media platforms, which could ultimately have a large chilling effect on, on the freedom of speech. So I think that recent discussions that have been ongoing in Europe for the past years on how large social media platforms is something that might be able to be transferred to other parts of the world, and which is that what, what really should be key is to demand full transparency of large social media companies in how they handle hate speech and possible harmful content 
demand transparency on how their algorithms push certain content to go viral and other others not. So rather than asking social media companies to comply to governments, whether they're democratic or authoritarian, I think the best or one a more fruitful approach that might work in both contexts might be to uh, to go for full transparency rather than to strive for government control over so social media companies. Okay, great. Um, um, I'm gonna go to I don't know whether it's oh Colin. Yes. Um, Oh, yeah, thank, thanks. Uh, nice to join the conversation. I'm not sure this is in context, but I guess I can follow on from the previous, uh, from Chris was saying, I mean, I mean, I'm based in the UK, we run an international search engine, it's used in every country, but we're based in the UK, but so it's kind of hard to keep up with all the regulations, the regulations that are coming, but the UK is a side that I know best. Um, you know, one of the things that were, it's actually in the online safety bill is the big issue here. And there it's actually the opposite where they're going to they're going to um, basically ask the you know, companies like us and social media uh, companies to actually police the internet and decide what to take down. Um, and you know the concern is is two. Firstly, they're uh, going to um, they're proposing to require us to act on um, content which is what's termed as awful, awful but lawful. So it's not illegal, but it's 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 awful but lawful. Uh, and I guess the other big point is that you know there's there's big penalties. So it's um, I can't remember. I think it's ten percent of world revenue or eighteen million, whichever is the bigger. Um, eighty millions uh, 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 would wipe us out. Um, and but in any case, I think for all companies, this is going to inevitably lead towards much more censorship. So you know, I'm a CEO of a company. I, I'm, I'm not going to if I've got any doubts about whether something is you know, is uh, an issue or not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be tempted to take it down because otherwise our company is wiped out. And the last thing I want to say is, and maybe I'd, I've been worried about the fact that, you know, if the UK brings in this bill and they're absolutely determined to do this and they're rushing it through, then I've been saying, because I speak to the to the uh, government over here and, you know, this is going to spread to other countries because other countries are going to say, you know, India may, I mean, maybe that India is not a good example. Obviously, you're ahead of the game there, but other countries say, well, the UK is doing this, so let's do it too. So I think, you know, I'm concerned about this. Um, the UK is very proud of it saying we're taking a world leading uh, bill here, but I think other people are going to use it as an excuse to do similar things. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for bringing that perspective, because I think then um, uh, just um, taking digs on big tech has become such an important part of how politicians pretend to conduct themselves these days. They just forget what these laws mean for a lot of other players. And, um, uh, and in their zeal to uh, uh, conduct public theater with CEOs of large American platforms, um, uh, we are just not paying enough attention about how uh, other players will react. And you're absolutely right when it comes to the existence of your business and the inability to have large legal teams, um, then you will uh, err on the side of uh, caution. Um, I, um, I think I'm being told that um, um, Shilongo, I believe, uh, would want to intervene. I can't see Shilongo Christofina. I can't see your hand, but I have been at least uh, flagged. If you want to intervene, please go ahead. Um, Chilongo Christofina. Okay, uh, jump in whenever you want to. I'm gonna move on to Oliver and uh, hear from him about this. Thanks. Um, it's, it's, sorry, it's a bit funny because you're asking three white men <laughs> about non-Western democracies. <clears throat> um, I would say, um, uh, so obviously we've got a group of people sitting there in Poland. Um, uh, I myself um, are half Polish and I think what you what they are seeing there in Poland, and perhaps we can hear from them on the ground, is similar to what we've seen in India, similar to what we've seen in Myanmar. Um, and uh, um, it's about the absence of uh, competing uh, sources of power. Um, uh, Western democracies tend to, you know, the nature of them being Western democracies is they tend to have stronger 
um, judiciaries, stronger parliaments, um, stronger media laws that protect free media, um, and also stronger public support for rules-based systems. Um, in countries like Poland, where the Law and Justice Party is stripping them away daily, uh, in countries like India um, and Myanmar to the extreme, uh, what we're seeing is that's the main difference, is that there's a real absence of those uh, competing sources of power, which would uh, prevent some of the excesses. That doesn't mean that the Western democracies aren't trying to do that, but at least there are um, other, other competing powers that try and prevent them from getting away, uh, getting away with it so easily. Um, but yeah, happy to hear more from others. Great. Um, there are the, um, let's um, take that criticism and move to Radhika, who um, uh, is um, um, from India, can tell us about what are the major differences we see between um, the Western democracies and the situations that prevail in um, our part of the world. Right. Thanks for that, Mishi. Um, it's very clear that, you know, there is a vast difference between a Western and, and you know, uh, and global, global north, uh, global north and global south. It's one of the biggest reasons is poverty, right? There's so much poverty. There's so much cultural wars that are going around uh, that it's difficult for you know for uh, countries like India, Myanmar, uh, etc. to just to you know stand back to the government. Uh, there, I mean, so many internal issues that come up prior. You know, like as you know, there's a very famous thing that we say here that a person who has to care about his, uh, care, who has to care about his food and basic housing will not care about free speech, and that's a that's a major problem that uh, that these countries have, and that's what that's what ends up in and like you know the difference in fight in the fighting back that happens across. So, um, what about India does have um, a constitution, it became a republic, and it does have three major organs of the government, which are supposed to create those checks and balances. Um, so Radhika, if you could spend a little more time about it, it's not just as Oliver rightly said, that there are supposed to be these competing sources of power, India yes. does have those organs. So why do we still say that oh people are is that 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 the same problem exists in a country like India, which perhaps exists in some other um, uh, parts where um, if if Myanmar is is the way to look mm -hmm. at, we are seeing um, kangaroo courts now um, forcing democratically elected leaders out. Um, uh, so but but India does have a robust system which it has built over seventy years. Why do we say that? Why is India also club together with all these other countries? Um, that's because India is a relatively new democracy. Eh? Uh, we still have weaker systems as compared to the Western democracies. We still have a lot of cultural wars that we are, st that we are fighting, which which render our, these, uh, these three organs of, uh, these three organs of a democracy very weak, right? We still, I mean, we still hear about, uh, hear a lot about corruption we still hear about like day-to-day -day world problems the one way that that these fights are taken up are through civil society organizations but i think we are all aware of the fact that civil society organizations in the global it is people who are sitting uh, in the western democracies who fund these organizations in the global south in in art like in countries like india myanmar mm, you know, Nepal, Pakistan, without really understanding the root causes of certain things. Uh, the civil societies are weak. There's a lack of, there's a major lack of awareness because if, if a country is in itself, like it has a lower level of literacy, has a lower level of education, uh, you know, to find people who would do this work is also like substantially less. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, and India specifically, um, India has a lot of um, a lot of internal problems that are going on. We have like an authoritarian regime. We have a government which wants to, you know, which wants to have a lot of power, and and that is what is weakening the system. And because it's a relatively new democracy, uh, the mechanism to fight back has also not developed 
uh, in a way that you know it is there in the Western democracies. Because again, it's people who fight. It's people who fight against uh, these things. Um, I'm going to move on to Prashant, um, just to ask a, a, a similar question. Um, uh, but in, in the context of when, when in the Western world, um, there is a whistleblower, Francis Hogan comes and tells, oh, this is all which is going on in the companies. Um, everybody comes, even the nonprofit organizations, oh my God, you can't kill Section 230, you can't do anything about it. The moment you will touch it, somehow every uh, minority will lose how to exist in the world. Are, are things actually that black and white in um, the global south? Yeah, I think uh, we are past that stage when we could give these intermediaries a complete immunity as to what were there on their platforms. And these are no longer, let's say, something like a, a blogger where you just post your material and then they didn't play any role at all. So Facebook decides, yes, you and I may be posting something on Facebook or Twitter, but what each person gets to read is decided by these algorithms. What is taken down is often decided by algorithms and also as we have seen from the uh, various Facebook leaks, even in cases where Facebook could have exercised some kind of control or taken down content, when there definitely was a problem, as like what happened in Myanmar, they refused to act on that. There were people from their own organization who flagged this issue and they refused to act on it. In such scenario, can we really say that they can enjoy their uh, safe harbor protection from any liability whatsoever. I think we are past that stage. They cannot any longer claim that, yes, I do understand that there is a discussion in the US, people don't want patch on section 230 at all. Um, that is like, um, I mean, something maybe um, more people say that the entire internet was built because thanks to that section. I do understand that, but I think uh, a lot has happened after that. Uh, these years, these platforms have, I would say, metamorphed into something else altogether. These are not those, uh, uh, what do you call it, the pipes with just transmitted content, dumb pipes. They're much more than that. These platforms decide what each person speaks, what each person hears. So they are the arbiters of truth in some. Uh, I would say some fashion at least. And when they have a complete control over content, I think um, they also need to take responsibility for the content on these platforms. I would say a complete, um, I mean, we can't, I mean, uh, what do you call it, put a blame, uh, put liability on them for each and everything. But at least when there are some major issues happening, uh, when content is flagged by people, Yes, it's time for them to act, especially on content like hate speech, which affects them on the which affects people on the ground. It's not just something uh, on an online platform; it affects people on the ground. Okay, great. Uh, people who are physically present, and I see that um, uh, the attendance may be thinning, but there's a microphone, and I'm told if you have any points to make or questions, you can intervene from the floor there. Please feel free to jump in if you have any questions there. Um, others, if, if you want to say something, I see a lot of good names and really nice pictures as well as, uh, but uh, um, if you don't want to turn your videos on, uh, uh, just uh, unmute yourself and jump in, please. Um, that's great. I, what it's, uh, so the point, Prashant, you are making is that um, the platforms have metamorphosized into something much bigger and something much different from what uh, the early arts uh, look like. And that's why it's uh, those arguments which worked um, early on don't work. And I think a point which Chris and Oliver had also made about the fact is that um, uh, similar structures and checks and balances and power don't exist here. Um, uh, certain democracies like Radhika says are still figuring it out how to actually keep continuing to develop those structures. Um, now, now, uh, now I'm gonna say is that, but there are also, several underlying factors that limit the effectiveness of governments 
and technology companies to regulate what we call this problem of hate speech. I think we've seen misinformation. We have seen hate speech. We are talking about um, whether it's in the Rohingya killing, um, and now there are class action lawsuits being filed against Facebook, Meta, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, what I want to ask is that, um, isn't that true that even good faith restrictions on online speech spark a debate about free speech and expression? Because the boundary between controversial opinions and violence inducing hate is not always clear. So even if something which starts well-intentioned and we want to say, um, and, and I would say that some of us will be guilty of that. We will also start saying, oh no, this is going to impact free speech and expression. Then what happens is that there is something, uh, social media does provide anonymity and spread the information, which becomes inherently difficult to regulate. Again, the problem here is we do like anonymity because it also helps a lot of people find themselves activists to do their jobs. And there are various other ways we can do it. Twitter as a platform likes anonymity. Facebook as a platform does not allow for more anonymity. And, and the third I want to just say is that um, political incentives also undermine how these are regulated. I think Oliver started with the fact that in our region, hate speech is so effective. Now, uh, you didn't say these words, but what you did say was that uh, because political parties are also involved um, and uh, hate speech is effective at mobilizing people and it gets um, it, it targets minority groups and it becomes very popular, at least with the majority uh, uh, argument. And these factors this create a strong disincentive for the politicians whose interest is to just drive those divide and get votes in one way. Then are we dealing with a problem which is just not solvable? And um, um, I would invite any of you to jump in instead of me uh, cold calling you. I'm, I'm really missing Nagat this time because we would have really benefited to have a voice from Pakistan here. Um, and uh, that would also be good for um, us all to have that discussion on the platform um, without any, um, because the, the problems are the same, no matter what um, our politicians would like us to believe uh, across borders. I, I can say something, uh, Mishi, if I may. Yes, please uh, do. Yeah, I think you, you made some great points, actually, that I can only agree with. I think what the Facebook papers and Francis Hogan, kind of the, the documents that were released, what they show, I think, is that the government of India and Facebook actually need each other and help each other, which makes it very hard to kind of get a foot uh, uh, to, to, to solve the problem of hate speech and, and, and how they might amplify societal conflict and those type of questions. I think that what they clearly show is that the company needs the government to access the great market that India is. And on the other hand, the government uses Facebook to extend its control over information. And at the same time, it is great for micro targeting of voters, for instance, that it uses Facebook's immense database and collection of data on Indian voters to just like send out this one particular video or message to manipulate a voter to ultimately vote for the BJP. So it works, I think, both ways. And that makes it very hard kind of to to tackle the issue because there are only winners there if you look from the government perspective and from Facebook's perspective and actually very little incentive to do something about major problems that are uh, uh, that India's democracy is suffering from at the moment, I think. And Chris, uh, you've studied other other countries or other uh, places, and uh, how do you say the same thing playing out there? Well, I've I've did my PhD research in Malaysia, and what I've seen there is that the the Malaysian market for a company like Facebook is less important, which gives them more. Um, 
room to maneuver and to take a more firm stance towards the government of Malaysia and a more principled uh, stance in, in that regard. And I think there, and what the, the, the Facebook papers have revealed very clearly and various whistleblowers, not only Francis Hogan, but that India is a special case for Facebook because it's the greatest market that, and because they can't enter the Chinese market, as you said. So they're very, very cautious for not getting into trouble with the, the current Indian government. And I think like the, the dynamic there is special because it's such an important market for Facebook. And in, in Malaysia, they, they could take a more principled kind of stance because it was less, less important for them. Great, um, Oliver? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, fundamentally when we talk about hate speech, um, I think it's important, first of all, to recognize that it's not new at all in any way. I mean, um, you know, we we're talking about India earlier and you could probably see quite a lot of similar trends uh, in the partition period um, and the same in Myanmar when they were going through the independence movement against the British. Um, I think one of the major issues in regards to the current climate is it's a very much a binary um, argument. Um, I've been working on uh, this uh, particular issue uh, in Myanmar, as you mentioned earlier, about the uh, today's $180 billion case under Section 1, uh, 230. I've been working on this issue for many years, and um, the main uh, problem seems to be that actually when we say hate speech, it's uh, obviously it's um, uh, there's a long uh, a line between what is uh, legal or uh, what is uh, awful, as was already said by Colin. Um, and uh, clearly, um, we also have to recognize that um, social media companies benefit from um, this emotive speech. That's part of their business model. So Drawing a line, therefore, between uh, what is um, harmful and not harmful, legal and not legal, is very complex. Plus, you've got all the mixed jurisdictions. But what is not so difficult is about using alternative measures that are not just about deletions, which is what the political discussion is generally always about. Um, you know, dealing with prejudices of all forms have always involved large amounts of counter speech and that's what we don't see much of from the social media companies we don't see them looking for um, more intelligent uses of their systems to be able to deal with uh, this old issue of prejudice that has now uh, spread and bloomed uh, online under their particular algorithms great uh, colin Yeah, thanks. I mean, my, our view is, is that the fundamental problem is, is, is tracking and the collection of personal data, because that, you know, that leads to, to actually, you know, um, obviously it's about so they can, uh, platforms can optimize the revenues. And so that means the um, adverts or content can be targeted, which then leads to division. Um, and so until, until, until reform is done on the collection and harvesting of personal data, the problems won't be solved. Uh, I mean, it's fine to use impersonal data. So if, 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 if obviously I, you know, you will want content that might be local to your region or for a time in the day, or maybe for a language setting you have, but, but all this targeting, uh, whether, it's, whether it's in the feed, a feed uh, uh, or in advertising, it's all here behind there. The tar that, that, that targeting those arguments should be based just on impersonal data so whilst, it, whilst it's based on personal data we'll, we'll never solve this problem you know, I mean transparency won't fix it I mean it will help it'd be very helpful um, you know content moderation will help but it won't fix it until we get rid of use, use of personal data it'll never be solved well um, there's an alliance about um, uh, using privacy as well as antitrust law to actually solve this problem and not just rely on content moderation. Colin, do you want to tell us what is your business model? Because the others perhaps say only with personal data can they make money. Yeah, well, so we're an independent international search engine, so we're, but we don't use uh, any personal data. So, you know, your, your, the search results for somebody in, 
uh, in the same place at the same time with the same language settings, you they get exactly the same results rather than the results being based on your search history or any anything that we you know that uh, wait. Google and Microsoft collect about you either directly or through their so-called privacy search engines partners like DuckDuckGo and so on. They were not search engines; they're actually uh, syndication partners of Bing. So we're we're the, actually the only international search engine that doesn't track. Um, sad, sadly. And which one are you? Mojik. Okay. Uh, well, here's a plug for Colin. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So, uh, um, all right, uh, we don't have much time left, but I'm gonna um, uh, move to uh, Prashant. And, um, uh, and I would like us to discuss a little bit here. I know that it is in the collectives that we find reservoirs of hope and optimism. Um, in, I didn't say it, one of the activists on my shirt said it. So I'm going to now try and figure it out that how do we find this hope and optimism and build alliances? And what are the problems we are facing in the global South, which we can't rely on our friends and alliance uh, al allies in the global North to fight for us? What do we need? How do we band together? Because everybody seems to be fighting their own battles right now because there is a race to the bottom uh, about what, how to break the internet, whether it is um, the US, the UK, uh, or the authoritarian regimes, or um, India uh, and democracies uh, like ours. So, Prashant, let's start with you. Uh, definitely, there is a need, even whether it's the global south or the north, uh, for the civil society to work together. So, as you said earlier, if you, uh, I mean, whatever are the bad models, the bad examples that get copied easily. So the bad laws get very, uh, I would say, easily copied. Uh, I mean, not to talk about the laws that Oliver uh, mentioned about what we inherited from the colonial past. Those are still there. Those are bad laws uh, like tradition. But apart from that, when it comes to the uh, digital sphere, the new laws which are being passed by, whether it's by India or by Brazil. So uh, there are like a lot of things in common. For example, something like a, uh, provision to trace, uh, uh, let's say, the, uh, the person who sends a message on social media on a platform like WhatsApp. Similar uh, discussions are happening in Brazil, in, uh, let's say, in India. In India, you already have a law. So when something like that happens, there is a, uh, I would say, there is a need for civil society to work together, form coalitions. Um, yes, uh, the modalities of it, we definitely can discuss, but uh, I would say the issues that we are facing in the global south are more or less the same. Um, specifically with respect to the hate speech issues, I think uh, whether it is uh, in, um, let's say, Myanmar or Bangladesh or India or Pakistan, we have similar issues. There could be, a, uh, when it go to the details of it, there could be a little bit of differences. But yes, there are racial issues, there are religious issues, and uh, the way the government tackles these issues, I would say, are also the same across these countries in South Asia. At least. And also, I, we would find similar, uh, let's say, responses by the governments in Southeast Asia. So definitely, we have similar problems. Uh, and I would say the responses from the civil society should also be of a collective and uh, working together to counter this. But um, I, I mean, I don't really have answers as to how we can do it. So yes. Um, open to hearing from others also on how we can take this forward. Um, we have very little time left and I do not know how much time uh, we will get, uh, but I'll move to Chris, Oliver, and then um, as it should be, a young woman from the Global South should have the last word and so will Radhika. But uh, Chris and Oliver and then Radhika. Maybe Oliver can go first. I can think for a bit. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I feel a bit bad taking away Radhika's time. Um, uh, so it, it, the way it works in Myanmar, I think our experience has been um, that basically uh, change is about the sort of triangle. And on this triangle, 
on the one corner you've got government on the another corner you've got civil society and on the third corner is the business which is really tech but sort of broader than that and the trick for um uh, solving any of these issues is to make sure that you've got two of those uh three corners um when it came to um uh, dealing with um uh, uh current issues uh, uh, the coup uh, obviously uh, civil society and uh, and the business community have tried uh, to uh, defeat the military's attempts to control the digital environment um, in the past it was uh, uh, the government um, and civil society and these are always constantly changing but the trick is to make sure that you can mobilize at least two of those three communities because that's the only way of balancing uh, and winning over the power of the third. Okay, uh, very quickly, Chris and Radhika, I've been told that we have barely a minute left. So okay, I will, I will go very briefly. Like I'm not in civil society, so I don't know anything about action, actually uh, like fighting for actual change. I'm more in this ivory tower, like uh, thinking about how societies work as a scientist, as a scientist. But what I can say is that uh, what I think is very important is not to think about these problems as technical problems, uh, but rather than as political problems that require a political solution. Facebook and these large companies tend to present problems surrounding hate speech as technical problems that can be solved by better artificial intelligence. And I truly believe that it requires oftentimes a political solution rather than a technical one. Great. Um, Radhika, very quickly, please. To keep it very brief, I'll say that internet was envisioned to be borderless and the solutions to prevent it from breaking up should also be borderless. It's important that civil societies, whether it be in Global South or Global North, should come together and find solutions together. Okay, great. Um, sometimes we have to do the work even though we don't yet see a glimmer on the horizon that it's actually going to be possible. Uh, again, a stolen court. Uh, because I like other people who've done the work and who've shown us the path that uh, it's when it seems impossible, we still have to keep plowing through. Um, thank you for joining. Um, uh, this is just um, uh, coming up on everybody's horizon uh, in a way. Uh, and to some of us who've been working on this for 10 to 15 years, it seems the conversations never change. Uh, but uh, uh, the problems keep rising. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, please support the fight, no matter which part of the world you are, because um, the race to the bottom is on and um, uh, we need to preserve the open nature of the internet. Thanks everybody. Thanks uh, uh, everyone from Poland who joined us and the IGF team um, and um, um, uh, uh, SFLC.in for putting this together. And thank you, Chris, Oliver, and everyone else who uh, decided not to show you, show us your great, beautiful faces, but at least joined us from here or anyone who's watching. Join the good fight and uh, support in whatever way you can, um, the fight to keep the internet free and open. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.